Welcome, uh, day 13, States of Change Learning Festival. My name is Brenton Kappen. Uh, thanks, Nicole, for the wonderful fade out there to the music to get you into the mood uh, for this session. Um, hopefully, you're here to uh, spend some time chatting with the OECD, uh, the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Alex and Ken to kick off. Thank you, Brenton. Good morning, everyone, or oh, afternoon. Um, so today uh, we're trying something a little bit different, um, and that's about looking at how the crisis can help us see things we may not have noticed before, how a crisis can give us vision to see invisible gaps. Um, just quickly, the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, uh, we're part of the Public Governance Directorate at the OECD, um, and we focus on helping governments take a more consistent and deliberate approach to their public sector innovation efforts. Um, so how does a crisis help us uh, see uh, invisible gaps? Uh, Kent, if you could slide. Well, a crisis can help us notice um, because extremes are more obvious than the usual. When there are extremes, things stick out and they stand out in ways that otherwise they might just fade into the background and we may just uh, see them as, as going on as usual. They um, can do it in three ways, I think. A, a crisis can accelerate trends and activity, drawing attention to what might otherwise have gone on more incrementally. For instance, I think uh, while it was perfectly obvious that governments were experiencing digital transformation, uh, the speed at which digital transformation has occurred over the past three months has been quite exceptional. And it's drawn attention to all sorts of things, I think, around um, well, the makeup of, of offices. What we have uh, one case we've seen where Canada, uh, the Department of Transport, the Ministry of Transport there has said, well, we think the default going forward will be to work from home. Uh, it's raised questions about, uh, you know, how do you manage work-life balance in, when your work is in your home all the time? Um, a crisis can also exaggerate things. It can make us think about the implications that we might have otherwise have ignored. Uh, I think there we can see, um, for instance, uh, things such as the, the need for real-time information and statistics. Uh, we have a couple of cases we've seen where uh, statistics agencies have been experimenting to get real-time information because the regular quarterly or monthly reporting on the economy or, or other things just hasn't been fast enough. The, the need for real-time information has been exaggerated and it's pushed us to think well in ways about what does that really look like, what does that mean for how we work now. And a crisis can illuminate things in new ways showing us things that have been hidden or, or unexamined. Um, again, we all know about the digital divide, but I think this crisis has helped highlight that in, in new ways. It's shown new elements of that. A number of countries have uh, dedicated efforts to helping disadvantaged students um, with the digital divide, but that's not been enough necessarily to overcome uh, the disadvantages of distance education for, for children. Um, so in these sorts of ways, we think a crisis can help us notice. But today's session is a bit of an experiment, uh, and we're going to work with you to explore this a bit more. Um, and we'll see what you think. So we're going to start with getting uh, a very quick sense of uh, who's in the room and some of everyone's different perspectives on what they're seeing in a crisis. So I'll invite you to either open a new browser or open your phone uh, and follow the link that's on the screen right now, which is www.wooclap.com slash crisis vision, which is a platform that seems to work really well, even if we all find the name really silly and don't like saying it out loud. So I'll give people a moment to do that. And I should, I can also put that in the Zoom chat if that works. Mm -hmm. And I'll just leave the, the first question up uh, longer to make sure that people 
catch on uh, and, and get into it. So starting with which sector do you work in? As I said, this one I'll just leave up a little bit longer than I will for the others, so people can get on. The link is still at the top of the screen if you uh, if you're still finding a way to join. All right, so we have. Unsurprisingly, not for profit and social and government are the are the bulk, with a, a few people representing from private and media journalism. And I'll now we're going to swap to where you located. You can just click the map, and we'll start to see uh, everyone's locations pop up. I see we have some uh, people from Australia and New Zealand from the Zoom chat. Lazy North Americans are not joining us at this hour of the day. I am Canadian, so I can say that. And we still have a few people joining the app, so. And it looks like India is represented as well. Nicole was bringing us in this morning with, uh, with a New Zealand band, so thanks to the Kiwis for, uh, for our morning jams. Okay, and next we're going to start getting into the content of how people are feeling about the, the situation that we're in. So, um, without swearing, what is a, a word, a metaphor, a framing uh, for 2020 that you think captures the, the zeitgeist and the paradigm that you're seeing right now? I'm previously on record as saying that I'm very wary of word clouds as any sort of analytical technique, and we are talking about analysis today. So, but in terms of getting a quick sense of what people are thinking, I think it's a good one. Time is a thief. How are we only in June? Uh, the, uh, I, I think my favorite set of jokes is uh, how the, the writers for this season of Earth are just really jumping the shark and doing way too much too quickly. The plot's all over the place. Dystopia, shift, hopes, circles. Perspective, I like. And I think, I think wow sums it up pretty nicely. 2020 is a write-off. And thank you for following my no, my no swear, swearing request. Okay, moving on to the next one. Um, which of these statements matches your perspective most closely? Uh, COVID-19 is a massive discontinuity and we're headed towards substantial change. In hindsight, this will seem like a relatively minor shock when we put it uh, in the rear view mirror in five years somewhere in between, or actually none of these statements resonate with me. And somewhere in between got a, a late race push, but uh, pretty substantially on the substantial change, massive continuity theme. And, uh, and, a, and a slight reframing is, how are we going to see this? Is it societies and governments will see this crisis up as an opportunity and will do a lot of work on sustained redesign of systems? Or 
this disruption is exhausting people and we need to get back to as close as possible to normal as soon as possible. And somewhere in between, none of these statements resonate with me. These are pretty strong, Manny. So I always, as, as an economist, I take the, well, on one hand, on the other hand, it depends answer to every uh, question. So I'm not shocked that there are people going with the somewhere in between. But we're getting 0% for this disruption is exhausting and then we need to go back to normal as quickly as possible. It's shades of change. And so on to the final question. The policy issue that we should focus on changing through and after COVID. Um, where does our attention need to be directed? I'm sorry that you had to see some of our uh, joking tests earlier. That was a quote from someone that we interviewed the other day. So mental health, public good, participatory, equality, social planning, welfare state, social inclusion, social fabric. And because it's larger, a few people have written climate change in a few different forms. Alex and I have also spent a lot of time on the, the how governance needs to change question. So. so thank you all for your answers on that. And so that, I think that gives us a bit of a sense of what people are thinking about the range of perspectives that we have in the room. Uh, but generally a pretty consistent sense that everyone is seeing uh, the world that we're in as uh, a fairly substantial discontinuity. So I'm going to return to the deck and pass it back to Alex. Uh, so uh, over the past few months, uh, the observatory has been observing and we created an innovative responses tracker to collect examples from governments around the world of the, the, the ways they'd responded to the crisis, um, ranging from, from big things to you know, economic packages and so on, to uh, really quite small things about shifting to telework or sh um, helping people shift um, to uh, lockdown or confinement times. Uh, Ken, did you bring up the slide, sorry? Um, um, one, oh, apologies. So we've now got over 400 uh, responses, um, mostly government, some uh, private sector and public sector, um, uh, private sector and uh, the community sector. Um, and there are some gaps, uh, but we think we've got, we're starting to get a good feel for some of the, the, the patterns and, and way, trends in ways that governments have responded. Um, and I'll let Ken talk about those. So when Alex starts the, the session by saying that uh, COVID has, or, and the crisis can reveal things, previously unseen gaps, this is a really quick uh, scan of headlines that have appeared that use the uh, words reveals, proves, shows the need for. So we have COVID shows the need to make learning more flexible. Uh, it reveals the need for migration reform. It reveals urgent need for infrastructure investment. And you can go on and on. You could find uh, one of these covering essentially every theme on the face of the earth. Um, and in some cases, this is very true. Uh, there are uh, fairly fundamental things about, let's say, with uh, social welfare, um, the people that are falling through the cracks that were already on the edge and now COVID has pushed them over. Uh, 
And it has become very, very obvious very, very quickly exactly how the system can let those down and how different countries are facing the impacts and the economic disparities of COVID very differently because of the way they've set up their infrastructure and their social programs for the last 10 years. Now, there is also a dark side to this because yes, while COVID-19 reveals a number of things that we hadn't seen, there's also just a tremendous volume of narratives out there. And there's a lot uh, that take the form of mm, COVID-19 proves the need for the thing I happen to care about, the thing I happen to sell. And so those of us in the public purpose, government, public interest space uh, need to be very diligent about making sense of these competing narratives, um, putting in some rigor and analytical tools, and not just latching onto interesting ideas, um, but uh, balancing the need for short-term responses with some long-term rigor and intention, um, fairness, and whatever values happen to underlie uh, the space in which you work. So we're, we're going to talk a bit about um, analytical tools. And first, uh, one is looking at what is actually happening. So uh, Alex told you about our innovation, innovative responses tracker. So one thing we can do is look at what countries are currently doing in response. Um, so of the 400 responses, uh, Alex has categorized them, categorized them into nine general buckets, um, uh, infection control and tracking measures, interesting ways of doing that service delivery in a crisis, uh, moving resources around to places that need the most, uh, adaptive responses by legislatures, structural responses, uh, communications, open calls, social solidarity, and we go on. And so if we take a sample of uh, 100 of the innovative responses that we've seen, uh, we see a pretty substantial cluster in the control and tracking, which makes sense because those are the, the innovative responses that are most directly related to COVID. Uh, a lot of interesting and uh, very rapidly produced ways of providing information and communications out. And some of these are almost crowdsourced like platforms, um, but many are just spinning up a website and, and data streams very quickly. Uh, changing how service is delivered, uh, moving to digital first, uh, digital courts, for instance. And then we have a, a, a number around, let's say, uh, government stepping into the space to provide platforms for social sol solidarity. If people want to match to help each other get groceries, um, things like that. Uh, and then, and uh, but you can see the the bulk of it's on the control tracking. The the one I will notice is the the structural shifts on the on the far side. In this case, that looks bigger than it than it probably is because it refers included in that is. Uh, any temporary social program, um, uh, emergency employment benefits, things like that, which are probably temporary and are already using the levers that governments already have to act. Whereas which of these turns into an actual change in um, the way programs are structured in the long term, uh, it, it probably overrepresents that because I, I don't think we're seeing much of that quite yet. And that's kind of the question that we're going to get into today. Uh, the other thing we can look at is say what policy levers are people using so of those 100 responses that we analyzed um, there are four different broad categories from your uh, public administration 101 university classes uh, so government can use nodality i.e its place in the system and its ability to communicate um, its authority which is the ability to make laws regulations policies and compel people to do things they can use their treasure and spend public money, uh, and they can use their organization. And probably the best example of this in the COVID context is um, national statistics organizations that already have tremendous amounts of data holdings and expertise, uh, being able to quickly produce the most reliable data models for others to uh, analyze. So clearly what you can see here is when we have a lot of people saying, oh, we're doing something really innovative, uh, most of them are using the existing structures of government in new ways, or it's about uh, communication and moving information around. Very few of them so far are government making decisions about how people will act differently in ways that we did not predict. Uh, and I think most people can think about social distancing rules and bylaws and fines that have come into place in a lot of countries. And so yes, that, that does exist, but no one submitted that as, a, as an innovative response. So it is also the context of the question that we ask that drives it. And very few are interesting ways of government spending new money that have been, uh, which are 
partially because it's a lot easier to spin up a website than it is to start making regulations or spending public money. So we see clusters in nodality and organization. Um, and that's one very quick sort of analysis that we can do. And there are a number of ways we can do this to put these narratives in, in context. So we can look at history, what language we use, what precedents we've seen in the past, um, how this fits into a longer picture. We can look at trends and patterns, which is what we just did with the innovative response tracker and a lot of the work that we do at the observatory. Uh, we can prototype and test something, put it into the system and see how the system reacts and evaluate it. Uh, we can do collaborative sense making, whether that is as groups of stakeholders or public participation and citizen engagement exercises to bring new perspectives into something. Because I think if we were to go back to that slide of COVID-19 reveals the need for X, if you asked 100 people with different perspectives whether they thought that was where the priority was, you would get somewhere near 100 different answers. And, uh, and then you can do more traditional forms of research and study. So uh, we think it's pretty important that we don't just talk to people for an hour. Even an hour is reasonably short for a session in a conference, but uh, especially over Zoom, we think some interactivity uh, and some hands-on is a much better way to do things. So we are going to do a, a bit of a quick exercise. So Nicole is going to break Alex and I respectively and all of you into two breakout rooms. Um, and then Alex and I will each share a link in those two chats and we'll give you a bit more instructions. But essentially what we're going to do is take, one, uh, take a problem that's emerging and dissect it a little bit using a, a lightweight analytical tool. Um, but the question that we need, so I need everyone to get really involved in the chat is um, what's a problem that we think that we'll think will resonate for all of us that uh, we have seen more clearly because of this crisis that we would like to spend a few minutes talking about. So uh, if, if people can chime in at the chat and we'll see if a pattern emerges really quickly uh, in the word cloud that we had in the polling at the start, we were seeing things like mental health, climate, social inclusion, social planning. Um, Alex and I have a back pocket one that we will force upon you if you do not become uh, uh, loud and ambitious. So I will, I will leave 30 seconds of awkward silence for people to chime in the chat, something they think would be an interesting problem for us to talk about. see Nicole and Brenton are modeling the behavior they would like to see. <laughs> and if you see one come through that you really feel strongly, but you could also plus one it or say, I agree with that. So we've seen inequality, social housing, food security, learning in a crisis, factionalism, insecure living conditions, data-driven decision-making, Uncoupling economy from well-being, and I really like that one, Caroline, nice to see you. Uh, In-person interaction, create and holding the spaces for citizens to influence policymaking, learning, and well-being. And Alex, I need you to unmute so we can, uh, we can banter about this. So, so far, we have two for inequality and two for different forms of learning. Any reactions to those? but I like them both. I need someone from the crowd to weigh in. I think both are good questions that, that uh, can be applied across different contexts for our multinational crowd. We, we have a, okay, there seems to be a bit of a cluster coming around inequality, and I think that's something uh, that works well in a, in a universal sense. So I think, I think we'll go with that. So, uh, Nicole, if you can uh, kick us all into our breakout rooms, uh, Alex and I will see everyone there in just one moment and we will keep chatting. Hey. So we're going to use a tool called Fun Retro and I'm going to put uh, a link in the chat. It doesn't require our account, which is why we chose it. And so I just put a link in the chat and that's where 
will go and I'll share my screen so you can also follow along. But to add anything, um, you'll have to jump on. Although if you, if you for some reason can't get on this platform, you could also add in the chat and I can add something for you. Um, so all you do is uh, you press this plus button here and you type a problem element. And then we'll, we're not just going to make a gigantic list of problem elements, we're going to make this slightly more complicated, but we'll do that slowly over time. Um, so basically what we're going to be doing for about four minutes is uh, having everyone in the room list what they think the different problem elements are of the idea of inequality as they've seen it emerge more clearly during the pandemic. What are the things that have, what are the different parts of it in terms of uh, it's housing security, it's, um, it's employment insurance, um, basically breaking it down into somewhat more constituent parts. Do you just want us to start adding stuff in, Ken? Yeah, please uh, just start adding. Yeah. And we'll do a bit of voting at the end so we can compare easily with. The other thing is we are now in direct competition with the other group doing the same exercise in a different room. So I'm not saying that there's pressure, but there's, there's absolutely a lot of pressure. And I'll remove my. And if you have any questions, just uh, send them into the chat. And you can add little comments as well with the, uh, actually, no, I think, I think it's just voting. Uh, no, you can comment. Yeah, you can click on the speech bubble and comment. And I might ask the person who wrote engaging the disengaged uh, to expand slightly on that and what they mean. I want to make sure that we can vote on it. So we're getting tons and tons here. And, We have a few talking about the impact on mental health. Uh, women and youth disproportionate impact, people with uh, lower digital skills, indigenous communities. Increase in family violence, especially in lockdown circumstances. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so I, I think that gets us uh, a solid starting point of elements of this. So as I said, we're going to make this more complicated as we go, but I'll only give you exactly what you need at any given moment. So at this point, we're going to go a layer further, and we're going to look, turn from um, the, the immediate features that we see, and we're going to start looking at root causes. So I've, I've added, a new, added a new column, and I'll ask you to start looking over there and adding. What are the things that, um, for each of those elements on the left side that you feel strongly about, what are the things that cause them? What is behind that?
So we're moving from the space of immediate to the space of, let's say, years. Although many of the things on the left side uh, are, are quite permanent. So it's possible that some of them fit in as well. Yeah, Sam, you need to open it in a in a different browser or on your phone. Um, yeah, no, I, I totally have it open in my other yeah, uh, screen. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's absolutely it's not working uh, properly. Uh, I, I, I have been exactly there. The other day, I tried to copy and paste something from one computer to another, and that didn't work very well. Yeah. So systemic racism, unfettered capitalism, insufficient or poorly funded infrastructure, overrepresentation of women in underpaid industries, yeah, there's some really, really good stuff coming up. And I think at the one of the interesting things is how even with a, a small group of us, um, we're looking at starting at very different angles, but that adds to it from so I'll give me maybe another minute on this one. And part of the danger of uh, not showing you all the columns at the start is that uh, it's possible you're like, oh, that might have fit better in this one because there's some uh, pretty substantial ones. But we're going to start getting into the what what I think are are the the, the two really interesting layers of analysis here. Um, and so I'm adding a new column now, which is worldviews. And so um, so let's say in at the top of the root causes, we have unfettered capitalism. It is both a root cause. Uh, it is also absolutely a worldview. That's probably true for systemic racism as well. So now we're getting into um, things that unfold over decades. Um, and it is uh, capitalism. Um, uh, I'm writing one because I, uh, it's one I see is the, there are different cultures in the world that are more individualistic and there's others that are very collectivist. Uh, and we see that manifesting in our economic systems. Um, and so colonialism, neoliberalism, yes, absolutely. So this is this is culture, this is values, this is paradigms, it's uh, it's models. So let's say um, I just added new public management. And so we'll spend a few minutes trying to go uh, another layer of, uh, of how deep the rabbit hole goes. And I think that's one of the interesting things that we're seeing is that um, there's the, the tactical layer of countries saying, oh, we're going to roll out this amount of money 
uh, for people infected by COVID that either they can't open their restaurant or uh, are temporarily laid off, things like that. And it's a, it's a specific momentary policy decision that relates to a moment in time, but you can trace back through that entire country's history and get to a pretty good guess as to why they ended up saw, uh, setting the amount they did, the eligibility criteria, um, uh, the duration of the benefit, um, or even how well their system is structure, structured to deliver it and how, um, how they communicate it to whom. I find myself wondering whether we need to uh, completely rethink capitalism or just fetter it in some way. We've had several references to unfettered capitalism. So. And I'll give one more minute on this one. Um, we're, we're seeing a bit of slowing since the first column, but I think it's also because some of the, uh, uh, and, and not unfairly, some of these appeared in the root causes as well. And out of curiosity, do people have the ability to unmute in the breakout rooms or just use the chat? Yep. Oh, unmute. Yeah, that's right. Um, there's only seven or eight of us, so you can absolutely feel free uh, to unmute and editorialize and chat. I just have children and a whinging cat in the background, so I thought I'd keep myself quiet. It's. Um, six months ago I would I would feel bad and I would uh, I, I would consider myself unprofessional if my dog was wandering around with her nails clicking on the floor in a zoom meeting but in, in 2020 that's just that's that's where everyone's at and it becomes great um, and uh, I think the the universal rule of video conferences is everyone wants to see your pets so I've added the fourth column which is metaphors and myths and this oh, will man. be uh, uh, sorry. Go on then. Um, so this is um, this is our centuries to millennia space, and uh, this is actually where we get into some of the things that we saw when we were going through the polling through WooClap earlier. Um, uh, people are using metaphors like uh, this crisis is a roller coaster. It's a new beginning. People are talking about it as uh, it's a war on COVID. Um, so those are the, that's the sort of space that we want to be in here is kind of these um, uh, like in let's say the United States with a uh, with a high emphasis on individualism part of the, re, the the metaphor and myth and narrative that leads to their social system is the like live free or die all men are created equal those are the sorts of things that we that, that start to appear as just kind of things ingrained in the way that we think. Um, and sorry, I, I think I interrupted someone who was going to chime in. Uh, Ken, I was just gonna show you my dog, that's all. My puppy. <laughs> Uh, I have to go back on the gallery view for that. There we go. Oh, there we go. Uh, adorable. There we go. Mine is. She's sleeping on the floor behind me. So I, I find it gets both more interesting and more difficult as we get into this space. Um, to try to capture something and something that feels universal. Uh, 
Gaia theory is a really interesting one. Uh, and it, it's interesting because uh, on its surface, uh, a phrase like make America great again just sounds like um, jingoistic sloganeering, but it does seem, it, it seems to come with a, uh, with a, 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 a set of worldviews um, and accompaniments around it. And that's as, I'll, I'll keep my comments circumspect on that. Um, Just uh, quickly, sorry, yeah. what is Gaia theory? Uh, I, don't so, know. I know so, of Gaia, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so Gaia theory is the idea that, you know, the earth is a living system. Yeah. Okay. Global okay. consciousness, and I was actually yeah. just going to jump in on that because I think, for me, what I think has been quite interesting um, in sort of connecting COVID to climate change is is the recognition that you know, that there is a connection between it. In, in some respects, it's a response to you know urbanization, deforestation, and pushing you know you sort of connecting sort of um, uh, sort of sort of wildlife with with urban life that has actually in a way prompted this pandemic and actually previous ones as well and so there's this idea that actually you know is this for a reason <laughs> is this the planet's sort of you know uh, its own antibodies kind of uh, finding a way of sort of slowing down economic growth which is causing its uh, causing its mm. growth and so with five minutes to go before we go back to the main room um, and I think we're, uh, so what I need people to do now is there's a little thumbs up icon in all of these and I need people to do a, you all have 10 votes. So I need people to go through a bit of a flurry of voting and bouncing things up to the top. Um, so that will make it easier for our group and Alex's group to uh, quickly compare and share. Uh, but we'll do that very lightly and quickly. Just, just to clarify, Ken, that's 10 across all of the columns. Uh, yes, you ha everyone has 10 votes in total. Cool. I suppose I could have made it 12 and then you'd have three per, but I, I didn't, so. Uh, okay, now you all have 12 votes. And I, I, and I just sorted it by votes. So I'm artificially privileging the ones that are already at the top, which I shouldn't have done, but uh, makes it a bit easier to see. So the interesting thing is that in our, in our metaphors and myths at the top of the list now, it is something that isn't really a, a root cause way of looking at the world that gets us to inequality. It, it's, it's, it's actually one of the things that would compete in that idea space. Um, So the problem elements we're going with currently the top is precarious work, increase in family violence, especially in lockdown circumstances, um, digital literacy, digital isolation. Um, and actually the, a lot of the ones that are tied for number two are, uh, can be very much so related, including mental health. Um, for root causes, capitalism and not involving communities in development of services, policies, et cetera and systemic racism. Um, worldview is not re recognizing indigenous worldview. For example, Maori. Coming from Canada and working in the government there, I, uh, uh, I've seen that manifest quite strongly in our public sector system as well.
And what is the most important thing in the world is the people, the people, the people. And so I think Nicole is going to uh, pull us all back in just one moment. And Brenton, I'd imagine we should be aiming for a, a hard stop at nine. Yeah, I, I, we, we, we tend to, um, we tend to lose people because often they've got back to back, so. Other meetings and whatnot, of course. I, I think that'll mean about a, a 5% uh, compression on the rest <laughs> of the session, which I think is pretty doable. Cool. Um, So thank you all. We'll see how we did in terms of how thoroughly we beat the other group in terms of generating ideas. This is, um, well, I'll contextualize this a bit in, in the group, but this is not meant to be an exhaustive exercise. It's just to put something in a little bit of practical context for us. Just to be clear, it's the number of ideas that will get us the win, right? Um, we will make the rules in whatever way is advantageous to us. Okay, excellent, good, just check. I mean, we can all jump back. Uh, oh no, yeah, you can leave the room, or is that just me? Yeah, or does that leave the room altogether? Oh no. Meeting. Back. That's leaving meeting. I just want to speed things up. That was my cat. <laughs> all right, we can't. We have to wait to get pulled back. Okay. So, 30 seconds. Okay, there we go. Thanks, Kent. Uh, share my. Um, so uh, our discussion um, may not have given enough time for the voting, um, but uh, some of the, the problem elements, uh, the economic resilience of households, lack of public space or in, unequal access to public space, uh, reliance on individual resilience, um, Unequal healthcare, uh, community resilience, um, different cultural and linguistic backgrounds, uh, insecure housing, crowded living spaces, um, and some of the underpinning root causes: the theatre of loss, urban planning, the design of the education system, um, and and so on. Uh, just scroll down so you can quickly skim quite a few in this one. Um, and then worldviews, uh, yeah, the belief that our fate is predestined, uh, capitalism, um, work hard and succeed, uh, belief in technology as a savior, uh, decision making in the hands of a few despite democracy, and so on. And then uh, myths of, of meritocracy, I think, is uh, one that came strongly through the under, underpinning metaphors and myths. Um, yes, I hand back to you again. I really like that one, the meritocracy. So you're going to stop sharing? Yes. Perfect. And thank you. And so um, doing this in a compressed fashion, uh, my read is that uh, even the two groups uh, ended up in very different spaces. And I, we didn't have meritocracy on our um, on our myths and metaphors side, um, we had a lot of discussion about the value of people and the value of the the um, the earth as a carrying system. Um, and so basically, what we just did is called causal layered analysis. We did a an obviously very almost straw manny lightweight version of it, um, and just building on the way that we were talking about what COVID reveals, but even the things that appear or get traction in the news. Um, they come from a very deep place, uh, and there's many layers of, of analysis that we, we, we can and in some cases have to do. The, the, the reason I like causal layered analysis is because, especially in a space of values, just not right answers, um, it's a way for people not only to disagree on the ideas, but to really genuinely understand where the other perspectives in the space are coming from, uh, which can be very uh, difficult and challenging 
but it is a better definition of the problem for why people are not in agreement on something, allows us to better understand it and then start to navigate it. Um, and causal layered analysis is one possible tool of, uh, of thousands. We thought it'd be an interesting one to do today given how many narratives are coming at us quickly. So it would give us a moment to slow down and think about something in a longer term view. So of those analytical tools uh, and ways of thinking we shared earlier, so basically we looked at history and language and precedence. Um, and returning to what people said in the polls, uh, people described this as a new beginning, a hurdle race, time is a thief, uh, it's a write off, it's a roller coaster. Um, those are the sorts of metaphors that subtly unconsciously place uh, something that's happening within your longer history of reference points. And to see that come out in, in a bit of analysis was really interesting. And what we also did was collaborative sense making. So as I said, if you put 100 people in a room and ask them to discuss an issue, you're going to get 100 different ways of looking at it. And everyone in each room had their own different things that bubbled up quickly for them. And the two rooms were very different um, in terms of what ro rose to the top. Uh, and especially when you're thinking about something as uh, complex and systematic as where inequality comes from and how it manifests. Uh, the, the challenge for those of us navigating these narratives and spaces is generating as much insight as efficiently as possible with innovation structures and, and um, scaffolding uh, and doing it in a way that's fair and inclusive as well. Um, so this is somewhat what we're in the business of uh, at the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation. Um, if you're looking to do collaborative sense making or prototyping, we have a set of toolkits that you can use and it'll kind of describe what sort of thing you're trying to do in your organization and give you a, a structure to do it. So causal uh, analysis would be one. Uh, if you're looking for what the history or what the trends are, um, that's where we get into our case study library about what innovations governments have been doing um, uh, or the specifically to COVID, the innovative responses tracker. And one thing that we just launched yesterday is uh, a community sense-making platform uh, to make sense of these narratives, but also build some tools to help people understand them in their own contexts, um, which will also fit into the next thing that Alex will briefly describe, which is coming up in November. Uh, so one of the things about the crisis is that it's been a truly global phenomenon. It's affected every jurisdiction in the world. Um, We've very, very rarely, if ever, had a simultaneous crisis. Um, and we've seen a huge amount of learning and uh, new initiatives come out of that. So how can we tap into all of that? Well, part of it is through events like these. Um, and uh, we know there are going to be a lot of events this year. Um, so what we're trying to do with Government Aftershock, our unconventional event for unconventional times in November, is to build on the conversations that are already occurring rather than trying to repeat them. Um, we don't want to keep on having the same competition, conversations in different places. We want to try and help connect the different conversations into a broader dialogue about what does all of this mean? Why is it important? And how can we make sure that the, the losses and the costs of this crisis can be treated as investments in a better future rather than just something we have to get over. How can we make sure we leave this with government stronger and better than before? Because we should expect and demand uh, government to keep on improving. Um, so what we're going to do with Government Aftershock is connect lots of local events all around the world through digital means. So lots of local conversations connected through some common uh, threads uh, and feeding into and informing some leadership conversations. And we'll try and we'll see how unconventional we can be with some of that. Uh, but the aim is to make sure that we push and prompt leaders to think about how do we make sure we embed some of the, the hard won learning of this year into our systems, into our forms of government so that we can go forward uh, differently. Um, and already uh, we've connected with, with uh, Nicole and Brenton through this States of Change Learning Festival. Um, and we're hoping to connect with others to draw on the insights from all of these different discussions 
uh, to draw on, as Kent was talking about the different emerging thinking and perspectives and narratives, to draw on the experience of all of those different innovative responses by governments um, to distill some things that can help us move forward. And so it is now 9.01 in, well, where Alex and I are. I think uh, everyone's in it, but it's at the hour. So uh, thank you to Nicole and Branson for having us this morning. And thank you all very, very much for attending and your participation. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And please feel free uh, to uh, get in touch with us or uh, follow our work. We'd be happy to shout. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day, all. Thank you very much.